At two to three weeks after surgery is usually the first post-operative visit to the office. And there's lots of things to talk about at this visit. So we'll begin with the leg. Uh, the incision should be well healed. Uh, again, there should have been no drainage from your incision from the time you left the hospital. Um, we we'll take the staples out of the wound at this point. We'll put stereo strips across the incision. Uh, just ignore the tapes, shower, get them wet. Uh, if they fell off tomorrow, it really wouldn't matter, but they tend to stick well, and chances are two weeks from now they'll still be there. And if that happens, you can peel them off in a couple of weeks. The leg is normally flaky and dry at this point. If you want to use lotions on the leg, you may. Um, um, just stay away from the tapes because they'll get all gooey. And then in a couple of weeks when the tapes come off, some folks like to put something across their scar, um, scar ease or whatever, to try to make the scar less noticeable, and you may do that if you want. It doesn't really matter to me. I don't have any products to recommend, however. Um, bruising. Uh, it's very common to have bruising anywhere in your leg from mid-thigh down to your ankle. Um, I usually jokingly say that there's no extra charge for the pretty colors. Um, it's really okay. It's very normal, and that will gradually dissipate. Some people don't get any bruising, but many times it happens. Once in a while, it's pretty rare, but once in a while, someone will be allergic to the benzoin and stereo strips that we put on there, and if that happens, you'll get a fiery red rash exactly where the benzoin was. If that happens, call me, and I'll help you through that. Um, once in a blue moon, that'll, uh, that'll come up. The support stocking, I've asked you to wear that. Uh, you probably still need to wear that. Most people uh, need it for weeks to months. Um, some people are done with it already, but the criteria to, to remove the uh, stocking is not... Uh, time, but it's really all about your circulation. The knee itself is swollen, and circulation gets down past your knee easily, but on the way back up, it meets that swollen knee and tends to back up below, and then the calf and ankle can swell. And um, eventually, the swelling in the knee will reduce enough that the circulation gets past again easily, and then uh, you won't tend to swell in the calf or ankle, and then you can go ahead and reduce uh, your wearing of the stocking. So if your calf and ankle are already equal to the other side uh, in softness and in size, then you can try to go without the sock. And if without the sock, then it swells and you put it back on. But that's how you decide. The stocking isn't doing anything for your knee. I'm trying to support your circulation and minimize your development uh, or worsening of your varicose veins and that sort of thing. If you let it swell unsupported, the tissues will stretch. And like blowing up a balloon over and over again, it just becomes the new normal. And then it can swell chronically. And that can be prevented if you use the stocking faithfully. Um, the splint at night, the knee immobilizer, assuming the knee is nice and straight in the office on this first exam, then you can stop the splint at night. Some people feel safer in it and would prefer to wear it, and you can wear it forever, but for the most part, the, uh, people hate the knee immobilizer and are more than happy to get rid of it, and uh, at this visit, you, you may. Um, then there's activity. Um, at this point, I wanted you laying down all the time. Uh, you can begin to be up and about a little bit more, but then the question is, what's the definition of a little bit? Tune into your knee. Whatever your knee minds is bad and whatever your knee doesn't notice, you live with the knee long enough to realize there's a certain amount of activities you can do that the knee just doesn't seem to notice, and that's fair game. But if you've done enough that it starts to throb or swell, then you've already crossed the line and done a bit too much. So tune into what your knee's letting you do, and you can do whatever's in that comfortable zone, and as you heal, it'll let you do more. Um, if you go that route, you'll actually get better faster than if you forever are pushing, pushing, uh, trying to do more than it's ready for. That just keeps the wound angry and sore and swollen and will make your recovery a lot more miserable. Um, and that, this rule of guiding your activity according to comfort carries on for not just a few days, but weeks, e even a couple months. Uh, you need to listen to your knee. If you listen to your knee, it will tell you what's fair game. If you stubbornly push it beyond what it's ready for, it will push back and, and you'll be sorry you did that. So um, don't be in a hurry to progress your activities. You'll actually get better faster if you, if you kind of relax and, and let the knee heal. Driving, I'll never tell you when it's time to drive. Driving is a safety decision. You won't hurt your knee unless you get in an accident. Um, so it's just not up to me. You probably shouldn't take strong pain medications and drive. Um, clearly, it's, it matters what time of year it is, or uh, what's a right knee versus a left, and what kind of vehicle you drive. And uh, I just don't answer that question apart from to say you make a smart, uh, you need to make a smart uh, driver decision for your own safety and everybody else's safety. You need to be able to make the emergency maneuvers uh, that would make you a safe driver. Uh, so that's that's your call. Also, at this point, I had you limit your uh, sitting. 
I didn't want you to sit for more than 20 or 30 minutes at any one time. You can stretch that out to uh, as long as almost an hour at this point. Um, the reason to limit sitting is blood clot prevention. Uh, when you're walking, the blood is pumped around and you don't clot. When you're lying with your leg higher than your heart, gravity pulls the fluids out of your leg and you don't get clotting. But when you're sitting, gravity pulls the blood down, uh, the knee swelling tends to re prohibit its return a little bit, and then it wants to pool in your leg, and there's no muscle pumping um, like you get with walking. So you can get clotting happening then. So you shouldn't sit for longer than 45 minutes or an hour. If you're sitting and you feel fine, it's just getting to be a while on the clock, then get up and walk around the room a couple times, and that's sufficient. And then you can sit back down again if you wish. If your knee's starting to talk to you, starting to be a little achy, then it's time to lie back down, put the leg back up, and use the ice. Uh, there's no limit to the ice. You can use it as much as you want. They used to say 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off. There's no reason to do that. You can put it on and leave it on. Uh, however, it doesn't make you heal any faster. You don't have to use ice. Uh, most people like how it feels. So you may use the ice. You don't have to use the ice, and you can use it as much as you want for as long as you want. Um, clicking. Uh, uh, we talked a little about clicking already. Uh, clicking is a normal sensation in the knee after a total knee. It'll, in time, it will muffle. The body will fill in nooks and crannies around the implant with uh, scar tissue, and that muffles it somewhat. Your muscle tone improves, and that will muffle it. So that's all common and typical. And uh, if it's, uh, Some people are quite disturbed by that sensation of clicking, but it, it does reduce quite a bit, and it's a normal thing after knee replacement surgery. Uh, back to the leg, it's, it's not at all unusual for redness to happen. Now, if the, uh, there's different kinds of redness. Sometimes there's redness around each staple, and that usually calms down quickly when you take the staples out. Um, sometimes uh, one side of the knee or the other will get a little bit red, and that's usually uh, associated with inflammation. Uh, if there's no drainage, uh, the redness is usually not um, associated with any kind of infection. It's also really common... Um, for the, your shin to get red, the skin of your, the crest of your, of your lower leg bone. Um, there's a lot of surgery done way down there, uh, although the incision's higher, underneath the skin we're often down there deep adjusting ligament tensions and that sort of thing, and um, the tissues there really can't swell very readily. The tissue over your shin can't move as well as, like, say, your calf tissue. So when it swells, it just gets more tense and quite tender and often red. So it's a common place to get a red streak uh, and, and be quite tender to touch in that area, and that's part of the surgery. You'll have noticed that your activity, uh, sorry, your pain has a, uh, a cycle. First thing in the morning, you're pretty raw. Mid-morning, best part of your day. Then you ache at night. The more you do during the day, the more you ache at night. And it's a, it's a kind of an ebb and flow cycle. That's normal. Um, the more you do during the day, the more you like at night. Um, stiffness in the morning, that's really quite normal. And that'll all melt away gradually. But that's a normal post-operative recovery sensation. Um, usually by this first post-operative visit, the home therapist is almost ready to stop. Some people need them a little bit longer. But once you're no longer homebound, um, meaning you're getting out of the house more, usually the home therapist needs to stop. Um, their goal was to make sure you were safe in the house and that your knee maintained nice and straight and that you were bending to 90 degrees or a little bit more. If you're doing that, um, you've learned how to work on range of motion of your knee. Uh, you'll go for a time and just working on your own. You don't need the formal therapist there. You'll, you should be able to manage the minimal stretching exercises on your own. In time, we'll talk about what I call phase two therapy, which is usually two to three months after surgery, and that'll be a strengthening program. But it's not time to strengthen yet. We're just working on your motion, letting the tissues heal, and letting the knee gradually mature. Uh, just increasing your activity from near bed rest to starting to get up and about a bit more. There's plenty of activity increase. Um, it's not time to strengthen very much. Some people have a hard time getting their motion. Uh, if you get your motion easily, then don't work hard on it. There's, there's no, no desire to get your heel clear back to your buttock, for example. Uh, once you have functional range of motion, uh, you're, you're fine. Don't push it farther, there's no reason to make yourself sore. And artificial knees really don't go heel to buttock um, very readily. Uh, the mechanics of that would be somewhat abnormal. If you're one of those folks who's having a little bit of trouble getting your range of motion, that's a little bit more common, um, there's some tricks to help you with that. Um, basically, it's bend your knee. But uh, the therapist will have some tricks that I've shown you. Sometimes you can place your foot on a step above. That's the surgical side. Put the weight on the non-operative leg 
and then with then while your your surgical knee foot is on a step up, just kind of lean in, and that'll help you bend the knee. But again, the weight's on the non-operative leg, and then you're just bending the knee over a step. Sometimes that helps. A glider rocker is a nice tool. You glide back, bend your knee as far as you can, plant your foot, and then just kind of bounce into the knee. Sometimes that helps. Sometimes sitting on a rigid table uh, where your feet will dangle and then just let gravity and just kind of swing it a bit and kind of bounce it off that tight spot and even cross your leg over and let the other one help a little bit. That can help. Uh, some people really swear by the porch swing. That, again, they glide back, bend their knee, and then bend into it. A stationary bike works well. Um, if you have a stationary bike, it's probably the best tool. I wouldn't go out and buy one, but if you have a stationary bike, set the seat as high as you can but still able to reach the pedal on the downstroke and there'll be no tension on the bike at all. And while you're sitting there, just rock. You won't have enough motion to go around yet, but rock forward, rock backward, forward and backward. And then the non-operative leg becomes the therapist for the operative leg. When your surgery side is, stops because of stiffness, then your non-surgery side can push, 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 push. And that's a very nice way to work on motion when you're in control and you're not worried about somebody else, a therapist or something, pushing um, uh, out of your control. So that works well. And, and all you're working on the bending, don't forget about straight. Many times people come back to, to see me next time at maybe six weeks after surgery and say, look how well I'm bending, and they're bending nicely. But then I go to straighten the leg, and they've lost that nice straight leg. Now, we use a straight leg every step you take, and you don't want to lose that. Once you've lost it, it's kind of hard to get it back. So, uh, um, but at the same time, at this first post-operative visit, you should be nice and straight. So if you're nice and straight, it's just a matter of maintaining that. And so unlike the bend where you want to kind of push more and more, um, the straight you just need to maintain. So prop your knee fully straight for just about a minute. Um, you won't have to have it straight all the time like you were up, up until this point, but stop, prop it straight for about a minute, fully straight, and then you're done. But do that about 10 times a day just to train those tissues to maintain full extension. If you feel like you're starting to lose the straight, and that can happen uh, with scarring because the scar wants to kind of contract um, you may want to go back to wearing the splint at night, uh, and if don't hesitate to call me if you think perhaps you're losing your extension. Um, again, it's easier to get on it uh, when it's a little problem rather than wait for it to get too bad. And then there's the medications. Uh, by now, you probably need a refill of your pain medication. Sometimes people go home with a little bit of MS Contin in addition to their oxycodone or some other combination of pain medicines. We usually don't give you more MS Contin, but you probably need more oxycodone or whatever pain medication you went home on. I'm happy to give you that. Uh, don't, don't worry about taking the pain medication. Many people are just afraid of it. Um, I have had almost no problems with addiction potentials. A little bit, but very, very little. Uh, generally, people who had that kind of problem had that problem before they ever came to me. But if you're taking the pain medication for pain, uh, then you're not going to get stuck on it. However, if you're taking you know, several pills a day, which is normal early on, don't decide to just stop all at once. Um, that's not addiction, but, but you'll feel miserable for a few days. And so you'll, you'll gradually taper back as the pain calms down, and you should have no problems with that. Anyways, you'll probably need to refill your pain medication today. I would encourage you to count out a full seven-day supply and set them aside. And then take what you have left over, and when the leftovers are gone and it's time to break into that reserve supply that ought to last you about seven days, that's a good time to call me so I can even get you more. It was, even at six weeks after surgery, only about half the people are off their pain meds. So uh, if you are and you don't need the pain medications, fine. But if you need them, it's better to plan ahead and, and not get caught short. So that's what I'm trying to accomplish with the seven-day um, supply so that I get a, plenty of notice to make sure I can mail you the prescription or whatever. Um, whatever you might need. Uh, I had you taking Tylenol every six hours. You can stop that if you wish. You, you um, may take it, but you don't have to. I'd like you to keep taking that aspirin a day for three months for my purposes. Um, the uh, need for the bowel help will de diminish as the pain medications diminish. The MS Contin is the worst nauseator and the worst constipator. That's the first thing to stop. Um, and if you need more medicines, more Miralax. Miralax you can get, that's the powder you put in liquid uh, to keep the stool soft. You can get that without a prescription. But um, keep me informed as to you know, your needs there. So that's the basic summary for the first post-operative visit. Um, don't hesitate to use that hotline phone number to call me if you need me. Um, 
Otherwise, you're gradually going to progress activities over the next few weeks, and uh, we usually rendezvous about the six weeks mark after surgery.